They're now broadcasting. Eric, you guys are all live and good to go. Um, and I do what I always do at the beginning of these, which is just double check that we are on uh, with one of my team. Is it working? Uh, Thank goodness you're in control, not me, man. That's all I got to say. There we go. Um, okay. Um, well, good stuff there, folks. Uh, look, I'm excited to have everybody join us today. We're just going to wait for a few uh, more people to sort of sign in as the numbers start uh, rolling in here. Um, let's just check here, make sure everything's good. Great. So, uh, thank you, David, for letting me know that you see and hear us. I appreciate it. So, uh um, all right, so we're just going to be a few more minutes as uh, we're seeing uh, people just joining uh, and we'll uh, wait a few. Uh, in the meantime, I, I think it's probably worthwhile uh, noting that uh, I myself am uh, showing my colors here. Uh, it's Thursday and uh, at Open Path, every third Thursday of the month, we drink uh, and we normally do so together, but today we're doing the virtual happy hour thing. And we call it the Catalina wine mixer. So I don't know if this shows up, but we absolutely <laughs> hijacked. We absolutely hijacked the uh, the movie Step Brothers, and uh, it just seems to work really well. So I I'm very curious if anybody feels like putting it in the chat. If they have a nickname for their happy hour that they do at their company, I I'm just curious to see if. I'm, I'm just like so impressed with with Open Path's discipline that you're you're only doing it uh, every three weeks. Most of us are doing it every day. Yeah. Well, can you, wait, so, see, can you can you see my uh, the back of my thing? Does that show pretty up? Pretty impressive, man. I think we should all get one of those. I think we should uh, send around some swag to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, well, uh, people keep dialing in. So what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll start now because I want to be sensitive to people's time and schedules, and uh, we'll go. So. Um, uh, as I started, I wanted to introduce a host of the folks that are on today. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm James Siegel. I'm the president and co-founder of Open Path. We're an access control provider. Um, uh, we've got Arnold Levin, who is the consulting practice leader uh, for, I believe it's the Southwest. Is that right? Or is That's Southeast? right. Yeah. Southwest. At Gensler. And uh, He's a guy who works with uh, both building operators, uh, large enterprise companies uh, across uh, their practice to really advise on the best way to approach design and has a lot of great thinking that he and his team have put together for uh, this new normal. Uh, we have Sean Moriarty, who is the CEO of uh, Leaf Group. Sean, thank you for joining us today. Good to be here. And uh, Sean will be giving us the perspective of an occupier. Leaf Group is a public e-commerce uh, company uh, with offices in various locations, uh, a pretty broad uh, customer base, and has great perspective on what occupiers themselves are facing as they try to bring their teams back to the workplace and think about the different puts and takes associated with that. Uh, and then Michael Beckerman, founder of CRE Tech. Michael, it's great to have you here. Great to be back, James. And uh... Hey, just before we start, I just want to really congratulate uh, you and your leadership, acknowledge your leadership and open path. And in particular, this series, part two, and I do hope that you'll keep it going, has been so informative for so many of us. And the feedback that I've been getting is really extraordinary. I mean, part one, you know, really shedding some light on what the landlords are, do, are doing um, and how Gensler got back to work. Uh, in Wuhan and, and part two from the occupier perspective, um, listening to Arnold and learning from what, what Sean's uh, experiencing. I mean, I think in this fog of war, I don't know any other way to put it, it's great insights like this that's helping people understand, you know, maybe we're not going back to work tomorrow, but we, we could start to think about and plan what it's going to look like and what companies can start to, to put into motion now in terms of strategy and planning. So. I'm just thrilled to be a part of it and be supporting uh, all that you're doing and super excited just to listen, be a fly on the wall and, and listen to uh, what all of you have to say. So thanks for having us be a part of it. Great. Well, I'm sure you'll have brilliant comments to add. And so let's, <laughs> I'm going to judge you uh, and these people in the chat, if you think Michael's comments are valuable, please say so. And if they're not, please oh, criticize them publicly. Shoot. 
Um, so with Dave, that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll we move on to the, the, the agenda for today. So um, we did the introductions. I'm going to talk a bit about a framework. And I talked about the framework last time, but we've got some additional thinking that we've put behind it in terms of how you might think about addressing get back to work. Uh, Gensler and, and Arnold uh, have great, some great analysis that they've done on some of the um, uh, perspectives on this as well. And then we'll have the uh, occupier's perspective from, uh, from Sean and uh, then open it up to discussion uh, amongst the panel and, uh, and then Q&A from the team. Uh, we have a Q&A tool that is built into Zoom. Uh, you can see it in your uh, panel, in your control panel there. And if you could please submit questions via the Q&A tool as compared to chat, that'd be great because then we can actually uh, track them and make sure that they get answered. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and sort of start. And, and I talked about this a little bit in the last presentation, but for those of you who didn't get a chance to see it, you know, we've broken down uh, the sort of uh, next stages of our next 18 to 24 months into a couple of different phases. Uh, the phase we're in right now is of course shelter in place. And that's as we rise to sort of the peak of infection rates to flatten the curve and you know, really put less of a burden on our healthcare system. Uh, there's going to be this period afterwards where we are pre-vaccine, uh, but um, you know, still having to go back to work in some way, shape, or form. And that's where I think a lot of the uh, sort of uh, confusion, uh, emotion, uh, politics, uh, variation and variability of the world we live in today comes into place. And, and this is the stage, frankly, where Germany's at. Uh, where a lot of uh, uh, the other Asian countries that have been through the, the early phase is at, and, and all of this is it, being iterated on at, at a real-time basis. All of this, of course, is to get to a post-COVID uh, realization of where we need to be. Um, one of the things that I think it's worth talking about is that there is a tremendous amount of variation and variability that we're all experiencing as politics come into play and people's emotions come into play. And the pendulum is gonna swing back and forth pretty aggressively during the next six to 12 months. Uh, as you think of people kind of uh, going out and, and then infection rates get higher and they come back in and then they go out again and they come back in. And the balance between the policies that our governments, both state, uh, federal, as well as local government put in place and the policies our employers, our companies and our workplace puts in place combined with our own human emotion of being cooped up and wanting to get out, balanced with fear of getting sick and risk associated with that, I think will contribute a tremendous amount to how uh, effective or, or frankly ineffective our, our get back to work plan is. Uh, there will be a point, however, when enough of us have antibodies, enough of us have a vaccine and have some level of immunity that we can actually start to uh, think about uh, an organized and cohesive plan. Uh, so with that, um, let me sort of talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the steps that we have to do. And, and rather than actually me talk about it, I'm going to hand it over to Arnold. And uh, he and his team at Gensler have put a lot of thought into all these various steps. So I'll, I'll let you take it from here, uh, Arnold. Sure. Well, thanks. Um, I really appreciate you inviting uh, us to the table here. I think this is a great conversation. I mean, we're having this conversation with all of our clients now. What's interesting, we've gone from two weeks ago where the conversation was helping clients actually work at home and, uh, you know, deal with virtual work. Um, and now everybody's focusing on what coming back to work begins to sort of look like. What we've been doing is, you know, putting together sort of what work looks like coming back in sort of two phases. You know, there's this first phase here um, which really aligns with, you know, James's outline, you know, previously that we're just calling resilient reentry. Um, and I think the important piece to note here, you know, is that, uh, you know, as, as James has in his, um, in his outline, we don't have the answer to what this is all going to look like. What, what, what this piece is pretend is, is intended to, to at least get out there to everybody, you know, is that there's a lot of decisions that have to be made around a lot of variables and a lot of them are really unknown variables. Um, one of the things that we do know, um, and I think one of the positive things to come out of this is that decisions on both these phases in terms of what we're calling resilient re-entry, which is really, you know, what happens when we go back to work in two months, for instance, um, you know, where we're living under conditions that are gonna be highly mandated in terms of social distancing and those types of things. Um, um, and then the final, what we're calling the new normal, what will the new normal workplace look like a year from now? Um, I think that the, 
on the client side, we're going to see a lot more involvement from various groups that go beyond the traditional corporate real estate folks or the facility managers. I think HR is going to have a huge um, you know, voice at the table. Um, I think for the first time with many organizations, um, individuals from the C-suite, uh, the C, you know, CEOs, CFOs, um, CIOs are going to have a lot more interest uh, in understanding and weighing in on what the future of work looks like for their organizations. And so I think that's a big benefit in terms of how we approach um, design strategy solutions. So this, um, this first piece in terms of what we see is, you know, what is it going to be like when we go back to work in two months from now, hypothetically? Um, there's, you know, we see three stages occurring. Um, and a lot of this, and particularly in first you know, in, in what we're calling the first stage, people and protocols, is really predicated on a huge variety or variable of unknown unknowns. You know, it's going to be depending upon, you know, which of our communities where we're living in, you know, have wholesale virus testing. Um, and that's going to really play a huge impact on each organization's ability and comfort level. You know, the ability to implement temperature monitoring uh, within the workplace and within the office building. Um, policies around working from home uh, as well as childcare. What happens if you can start going back to work, but your child's school is still closed uh, because they haven't reached uh, that level? You know, what kind of protocols need to be in place uh, for that? You know, cleaning and hygiene protocols you know, need to be implemented, you know, both at the organizational level as well as the building level if you're a multi-tenant, uh, you know, organization, you know, within a large office building. You know, what's the role of social distancing? You know, again, you know, social distancing is going to be with us for at least a year from what we're hearing, you know, in most of the, you know, um, uh, places where, where we're uh, working in. And I think, um, you know, even going back to work, how does that impact going into an elevator? How does it impact, you know, going into an office, you know, location where you're sitting in a, in a benching uh, atmosphere where you've got, you know, people that are four feet away as opposed to six feet away. And so, you know, all of these things play a role, but again, the next piece of this, you know, which I think is really critical is understanding the organizational component of this. Um, and I think the ability to be able to understand where your organization is in the realm of all this, you know, becomes really critical. And the big unknown, aside from the policy issues around, around, uh, around um, you know, um, uh, the virus, you know, and contamination issues and what kind of public policies are in place. We also have an emotional level, which, you know, James referenced. And I think for the first time, we're dealing with a crisis situation that has a huge emotional um, and, you know, and, and real traumatic impact on the part of most people. Uh, particularly if you're living, you know, in major metropolitan areas like New York, uh, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, New York, and Seattle, um, you know, areas that have been hit pre pretty, you know, hard by this. Nobody knows what the emotional piece of this is going to be in terms of what is it going to take for an organization to get their employees comfortable. And so the things that we're looking at with our clients, you know, are being able to, you know, have more empowered teams to be able to create organizational um, constructs within their enterprise that are much more agile. And so we're seeing that organizations are going to need to adapt a whole different organizational model to this new normal. Um, and lastly, you know, what is, you know, what's the impact going in for, um, you know, day one and a half, you know, when you are able to go back with social distancing, you know, and so all of these things begin to set up a lot of real interesting um, and highly, you know, um, um, provocative questions, uh, which again, there's no one answer. And I think for every organization, I think this is the important thing to note, it's going to be somewhat different for every business. Um, you know, and it's going to be very different depending upon what geographic location you're in. I mean, you know, myself working in the Southwest region, I see talking to clients in Los Angeles, a lot of these issues are very different than the clients that I'm working with uh, in the Phoenix area, for instance, or in Denver. Um, and so I think, you know, looking at all these things becomes critical. Um, you know, what will happen, you know, in terms of rentable square feet per person with, you know, living in a world of social distancing? You know, we've gone from a world, you know, of, you know, you know using every inch of square footage to now an environment where we are going to have to create more space in between people, uh, more open space. Um, you know, what's going to happen in terms of shared amenities in office buildings where you're not the sole tenant uh, that's involved? So what we've done to take it to that next level is assuming that, you know, once we get past this first stage, 
of going back to work and we dealt with the protocols and we you know you know created the policies of, of, of going in you know what are some of the scenarios that we are seeing with clients you know for what we're calling that next level of, of new normal you know a year from then you know where you've got the ability to begin to look long term for how you're utilizing the workplace uh, and how you're us utilizing your um, um, your real estate um, that you have. And so we put together four hypothetical scenarios, you know, and they range from the what ifs to some more practical things that we're seeing with questions. And if we have more time, we could probably put four more um, scenarios. So the first scenario, you know, is, is, is what we're calling the seasonal mobility scenarios. And it's really based on the fact that, you know, this is not going to be the last uh, um, you know, pandemic that we deal with. I think, you know, people like Bill Gates have been talking about this coming for 10 years now and nobody's really paid attention to it. I think the one thing that's going to happen as a result of this, we're going to get much more organizations that really take seriously the fact that, you know, the next pandemic is just around the corner. Um, and so, uh, and it's going to be seasonal occasionally. You know, you know, those of us who live in the Southwest, you know, deal with wildfire seasons. You know, all of these, you know, crises that happen in terms of climate, you know, issues are becoming much more critical in terms of, you know, how they are playing out. You know, and so if you're living in the East Coast, hurricanes are becoming much more violent. So all of these, um, uh, you know, crises really are shutting down businesses. Um, you know, so it's not just the pandemic that we're dealing with. And in this scenario, we're seeing that there's good, that there could be a continuation of, of people working from home. Um, and you just come back to the office seasonally uh, when these things are, ha are are not happening. And so, you know, again, putting the pandemic aside, if you're living, you know, in the San Francisco area, uh, you know, in California, you know, where there's wildfire seasons or in Los Angeles, you know, you come back to work in the seasons where there is not a, a, a fire hazard and that type of thing but you're still maintaining a work from home policy uh, like people are going through now. The other scenario is what we're calling a functional team mobility scenario, where again, you know, organizations sort of modify their organizational structure and base work life in most organizations on teams. Um, and so again, you've got a workplace, you know, that has basically shared offices that people come to work uh, as teams, and so you have, you could have for you know week one and two, you know team A is coming to the office and working, uh, things are cleaned up, and then week three and four, team B is coming in, and so you know that's another scenario. Again, you know all of these begin to sort of dictate and suggest a lessening of the amount of real estate that one needs, uh, but it also begins to put into question, you know, where are you going to locate your your offices? Scenario three, which we're seeing a lot of and a lot of questions about is, you know, if you take into consideration the work modes that all organizations are involved in, in terms of collaboration and engagement, you know, focus work, learning and training and social interactions, where does that occur? Um, and so in this scenario, we see, you know, that you, you know, that if that you allow people who are doing focus work uh, and are not involved in collaboration on a daily basis to continue working from home. And in essence, your workplace, you know, becomes an office hub, um, you know, a place where you have training facilities, uh, conference facilities, it's the corporate brand where you're bringing clients and customers to. Um, but basically, if you're doing individual focus work, you're not coming into the office. We're doing a project now uh, for an organization uh, in the Phoenix area, uh, a large organization, a health insurance company uh, that's occupying 500,000 square feet of space today. Uh, they hired us before the pandemic to do an analysis of where they need to be and should be going forward. We had originally recommended an agile workplace strategy with them with desk sharing for a whole host of good strategic reasons. And we were bringing their real estate down to 320,000 square feet, going from five buildings to three buildings. And when we presented the final report, the CEO turned to me virtually um, and said, you know, we're working successfully from home now with 99.9% .9 of our staff. What happens if we continue that? How do we rethink our corporate campus and our corporate headquarters? Could we go down to one building and just use that as a convening uh, location where, again, it's a place where we do training and collaboration and that type of thing? So this is a very real scenario, which has some very interesting impacts in terms of real estate. The last one takes the total opposite approach and says, you know, you're an organization that the only way you're going to get your staff to be comfortable and feel safe and secure coming back to work is to provide private offices. 
And so we're calling this the hyper-private workplace. And while a lot of us don't think it's necessarily long-term the best solution, again, one of those unknown unknowns is the psychological factor. You know, what is it going to take for an organization to get their staff and employees to feel comfortable that the workplace is a safe environment to work in? And so in this scenario, you know, it's, it's an 80% uh, environment of private offices, albeit smaller offices, potentially 90 square foot offices um, that are arranged around open areas to create some sense of openness and collegiality. Uh, but this scenario would dictate more square footage that is necessary, you know, going from environments that have been highly densified um, and, you know, with the goal of minimizing your square footage. In this one, you're occupying more square footage. You know, the other implication of this, you know, where does this happen? Um, you know, potentially you're going to areas of uh, the city that, that have lower rents because you're taking more square footages and potentially in geographic locations where the suburbs become less expensive, you're moving from the cities to the suburbs. In some cases, like in downtown Los Angeles, where the rental rates are lower downtown, you could have more businesses coming downtown uh, because of this. So the whole intent of this is really to lay out for everybody the fact that there's not one answer. And I think you know the, the, the real objective is to be able to understand that there are so many unknown unknowns um, that each organization needs to look at these scenarios uh, seriously in terms of what works best for themselves. Excellent. Well, uh, as usual, you've given us a tremendous amount of information to think about, and I think we'll have a robust discussion on that. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is um, kind of tee up uh, Sean and Lee group, and I was looking for a way to quickly show you a little bit of their corporate culture and office space. And so uh, we actually had a case study that we did with him for their deployment of OpenPath, which I thought would be a nice way to just give everybody a sense of, you know, what does the Leaf group do? And, and also what is their you know, people and office space look like. So let's take a moment and uh, I'll just show you about a minute and a half of this and then I'll cut it off before it gets too salesy. I'm Sean Moriarty. I'm the CEO of Leaf Group, a diversified consumer internet company in Santa Monica, California. We have a very diverse workforce, lots of millennials to Gen Xers, and most of our folks also mirror the audiences that we serve. So really passionate, action-oriented from all over the globe. Our workplace is really important to us, how it feels, how it looks, and it needs to be consistent with the culture. So we really try to marry technology with art and design. Leaf Group's publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And one of the things that's really important for any publicly traded company is to make sure that your compliance in every aspect of your business is truly top notch. Open Path is a solution that allows us to sleep at night knowing that we have the best technology possible for physical security in our building. Our days are 24 seven and we have people coming and going constantly. And having a safe, secure work environment is extraordinarily important to us. And so we want to give our people the ability to come and go as they please, and also to make sure that we have the utmost in safety for that work environment for them. It's one of the few systems that I've ever rolled out where people have actually told me how much they love it. Oh, everybody loves the ability to just punch into their phone, walk up to a door, it opens and they're just granted access. I would definitely recommend OpenPath to anybody looking for an excellent access control system. I'd recommend OpenPath to any company, public or private, that really I'm going to cut it off here before it gets too salesy, but um, uh, especially now that Sean already said he recommended Open Path, which you don't really need to say more than that. Uh, but, um, you know, with that uh, context, uh, why don't we um, hand it over to Sean to talk a little bit about some of the uh, opportunities and challenges he's facing as they think about getting their teams back to work. Sean, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, James. Uh, very, very happy to be here. You know, I think it's interesting. So, we're operating at a time where, you know, we have, I would say, almost unprecedented lack of visibility of what the future holds for us, I would say, in near to midterm, right, which is um, we will get on the other side of this pandemic sometime over the course of the next couple of years. 
And if you listen to uh, you know experts, we expect that it's going to be some graduated rate of return to normalcy over time. And everybody's trying to figure out what those next steps are. And we're no different. And what I try to do, um, you know, as a team, we meet and discuss this almost daily, is really to go through the basics. You know, the kind of the six interrogatives. You know, who, what, where, when, why, how and then map that to the reality that we're facing today. Um, you know, into the, the, the first bullet, this notion of looking at, you know, every member of our team, what they need to do in order to be successful, to be productive and be, funct be functional on the basis of their role. What do they need by way of physical access? And so you've got to develop um, your plans around the unique needs of teams, groups, and individuals. Um, the, the hardest part in what we're dealing with right now is the when. And so now one benefit of that is it, you get to spend an awful lot of time on the what and the how. You know, the vast, you know, our workforce has been working from home since the second week of March. We had been working on a work from home or remote work strategy really for the better part of the past year, not driven by pandemic concerns, but the fundamental reality that with a business located in Santa Monica, California, Denver, Colorado, New York City, as every year goes by, traffic gets worse the market for talent gets more competitive and really trying to reimagine the way we work together as a team. What is the right balance of remote work uh, and physical proximity uh, organized around central offices? Um, you know, the, you know, to the, the earlier point about using technology so that we can actually work almost on an indefinite basis uh, remotely has been key to us. Um, you know, I would say our team, particularly our people team, had done a great job in advance making sure we had the tools and the processes available to flip effectively to indefinite work from home very, very quickly. Um, and it's something that every company is going to have to get very good at. Um, you know, when we think about um, the privacy versus health issues, Realistically, that will be negotiated as a culture and as a society. It's going to be negotiated at the federal, state, and local level, and it's going to be negotiated and every you know, country on earth will evaluate, uh, reevaluate privacy versus health. Um, you know, to Arnold's point earlier, in the absence of, absence of widespread testing, you have an enormous denominator problem, which is how do we know where we are with respect to the stage that we're at with pandemic by virtue of the fact that uh, knowing the infections that are out there? Um, and so, you know, I think what we are going to see is um, demand for greater knowledge, albeit on an anonymized basis, right? Because what we're really looking for is to know what percentage of the population is at risk which is healthy, which has already been exposed and can return back to work safely. I don't believe you need to um, take privacy away at the individual level in order to provide that. I think kind of their traditional approach is to respecting people's um, private medical knowledge can be met while at the same time companies and governments can know, roughly speaking, how to protect their workforce populations. Um, to what I said earlier, the hardest question is timing, right? When do we act on this? Because we are not going to go back to whatever we would like to call normal levels of risk are at any time in the near future. Um, but I think it's also likely that we will start taking steps to get back to the new normal as we better understand the risk factors and those risks will be better calculated. Um, we seek to, you know, to look every day at the latest data and really rely on the guidance of, you know, the CDC, the WHO, and, you know, in our cases, the state and local authorities where we have physical nexus and offices, and we're going to be guided by that with our return to work strategy. Um, you know, and, and I don't know, we, you know, it wouldn't be prudent for me to say at this time um, when we, you know, you know, we're going to make that decision to start returning people back on a regular basis uh, to our buildings. Well, 
Uh, I think that's uh, that's a great overview. And I think, you know, you guys, uh, like you said, you have a geographically distributed uh, organization. You have not just, you know, an office worker community, but you have, um, you know, more factory warehouse folks to think about. Uh, and you have a whole sort of slew of different, uh, you know, you know, business needs to sort of, you know, contribute to this. Uh, I know we as an organization are dealing with that ourselves in terms of, you know, we have manufacturing and shipping that needs to happen from a 3PL or from our own uh, warehouses, uh, along with uh, a development team that is used to working remote, but also needs to collaborate together. So as I think about Arnold's slides and the whole idea of um, the office space being a place where you don't work every day, but maybe you come back to every now and then for meetings, uh, that feels like something that we might adopt more so than everybody being in the space together uh, all the time, which was sort of the way we used to do it. Uh, I, I don't personally want to invest in demising my space and re, you know, figuring it out. I'd rather sort of, you know, sort of set up work shifts so that in a space that accommodated 100 people, I only have maybe 20 people coming in during a shift and they stay away from each other. And I base that not on uh, groups working together, but where people are. So I'm curious to sort of uh, hear what the rest of you think in that respect. Like, do you think about coming back in, in, in work shifts? Uh, or do you actually want to try to put, you know, operational or organizational groups together at the same time? Yeah, you know, I think it really depends on the nature of the actual work. And, you know, what I would expect is for those companies, you know, like we do to have the, the luxury to have, you know, the majority of our workforce be able to work from home or work remotely, you have a little more discretion and flexibility in how you figure this out. The one thing I should point out, though, and, I, you know, because it doesn't get talked about enough is, you know, there are still upwards of 80 to 90 million Americans, for example, going to work every day. People say that roughly 30% of jobs today are truly work from home or work remote type jobs. So the majority of our economy is, is driven by jobs that require physical nexus. And while that's not really the thrust of our conversation, I do think it's important, you know, for the audience to, to ponder that as well. I do expect that technology, you know, with every passing year will make jobs more capable of being done remotely, although certain jobs will be, you know, obviously people will have to congregate in a physical place for quite some time. And, you know, I think that's an important uh, consideration. And I think the roadmap um, in many ways was one that was inevitable, meaning this pandemic, I would argue, has only accelerated what were to be inevitable changes anyways. Um, that we probably all resisted because we were stuck in one way of doing business for so long, which is the idea of a company is really centered on this notion of physical space and a culture set by people working in close proximity to one another every day. And what's being tested is how much of that in this new world with new technology is actually necessary. And I think one of the great benefits out of this you know, tragedy itself will be the reimagination of how we all work in ways that lead to probably greater flexibility and more creativity and actually give people back substantial hours of their day that were lost to the commute or the inefficiencies of navigating physical space. Well said. Well said. Uh -huh. So look, so there's a lot of uh, questions kind of coming in. And uh, I think um, one of the things people brought up is how do we deal with commuting? Uh, you know, everybody has to get to work. Uh, in LA, most people drive and don't take public transport. But in New York, you have to get on a metro or a train or so forth. So how do we think um, we want to get our people back to work given the proximity associated with, uh, you know, public transport and, and the commute in general? Uh, I don't know, uh, Arnold, I'll maybe point to you on that. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, that was one of the buckets that we had in that serpentine graph um, yeah. was, you know, was, was transportation, which I think is obviously going to be very different in different parts of the country. And, and as you said, you know, if you're living in Southern California, where people, you know, have lived in their cars all this time, the fact that we've been trying to speak to the, you know, to the, you know, to the, the, the virtues of public transportation over the past five years and gotten more people to use public uh, transportation, I think that there's going to be some, you know, it's going to set back public transportation in Southern California somewhat, um, where people have, you know, have been comfortable with their cars. I think if you're living in areas like, you know, New York City and San Francisco that are highly dense and you, know, you, you rely 
on you know swift access to to your place of work um, you know with public transportation and you have to institute social distancing I think they become both political and logistical um, um, you know crises in and of itself um, I think one way that people are going to look at it you know is you know, A, the ability to spend more time working at home and you only come into the office, like one of my models shows, you know, when you need to come into the office, mostly for collaborative functions. Um, and so there's going to be much more of a reliance on organizations working from home. Um, and again, I mean, I can see that, you know, that whole notion of strategies around working from home, you know, differing in terms of intensity, depending upon, you know, where you live geographically. You know, the other thing is, you know, being able to, you know, come into work in, in different stages. And so you're going to find people coming into work later in the day versus earlier in the morning. And there's other strategies that you can work with. But again, I think, you know, what we're going to find is that, you know, each location and each, you know, organization is going to have to come up with what those logistics are uh, based upon the viability of their staff. All right. Um, well, I think another question that just came in, and I just launched a poll, by the way, because uh, I tried it last time and it was pretty cool. So um, that's exciting. Uh, I'm looking at all the Zoom gizmos and buttons. It's kind of cool. Uh, somebody asked, this is for Gensler, how do you envision the implementation of a touchless building uh, being, do you see a split between the building owner and the tenant since it will take their separate systems to be integrated? So maybe if you want to uh, take a pass at that, Arnold, and I, I certainly have a perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question because I think that there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be necessary to to go in, and you know, especially if you're in a multi-tenant building, um, and so the you know the technology pieces are going to add a huge cost, you know, to somebody within that building, whether the the landlord you know bears the brunt of that or whether it gets you know shared um, across all the tenants. I think a lot of that is going to be impacted by a the um, the, the viability and necessity of the landlord to, to attract tenants, you know, into the building and what they're willing to pay for and to give up. Um, but I think it's also going to be, you know, again, you know, what, and the impact in terms of the economy also, you know, which we have to take into great consideration in terms of the hardships financially that everybody is dealing with from both the tenant side as well as the landlord side. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an important question. I don't think that there's one answer. I mean, I think it's potentially going to be, you know, different again in different geographic locations. Um, and at the end of the day, it's probably going to be borne by both. You know, you're going to have some locations where the landlord is going to have to institute it. I think long term, you're going to find that the landlords are going to have to do that to make their buildings attractive for tenants. Um, and I think going you know, back to work initially, um, I think the question is going to be, can tenants afford to contribute to that or are landlords just going to have to do it in order to keep their buildings open? And before you jump into that, James, and also my, the other part of that question could be, do you envision the government in any capacity having um, some funds or some incentives available to retrofit some of these spaces for health and wellness of, of mm -hmm. people coming through them? Yeah, I mean, to your point, I feel like we at Open Path, the, the canary in the coal mine, this is sort of uh, me saying, I, I see that tenants are financially strapped, and frankly, a lot of them are not paying rent. And um, you've got, uh, you know, landlords who are looking at the uh, table stakes of investing in um, automatic touch-free access, uh, you know, uh, elevator and occupancy, uh, you know, control, especially in a multi-tenant building. And, and that capital needs to come from somewhere. They have reserves, but that, those reserves are, are, are not going to get used up, uh, not by just this. Those reserves are going to get used up by, you know, basically the fact they're not driving revenue from tenants not paying rent. And then they have lenders that are uh, having to look at these uh, building owners and operators and, and realize, wait a second, there's no better person to own or operate that building than the person who does today. So I'm not going to foreclose on that property. But boy, I sure uh, need some help uh, as a lender to make sure that, you know, I myself uh, am financially, um, you know, responsible with uh, the, the, the loan that I have for this property. And what that means is uh, there's some level of government, um, you know, backstop that has to happen, whether it's on a local level to uh, fund uh, some of the capital investment that has to happen uh, to improve the quality of the workspace so that it's ready for people to come back and have a germ-free or hands-free or social distancing ready environment. 
uh, or frankly, uh, uh, to help backstop the lenders, either with tax deferment or uh, tax incentives to help uh, you know, pay for this. Uh, but there's just no way to just expect this to magically kind of happen. I, I do think, however, that um, when you tie the building system in to the individual tenant systems, you get uh, a lot of benefit in being able to really see the path of people through the building and track all that. And in a multi-tenant building, that's a, a unique uh, capability. I think where Sean comes into play is he has a single tenant building. He has his own building. It's just him. Uh, and so I'm curious, Sean, like when you think about your building, uh, you've already got some technology in there. Do you think about, oh, I'm going to ask the landlord to do this or no, it, it's, it's, it's your cost. It's your headache. It's, it's your obligation. Or how do you think about that? Yeah. So you know, I think, you know, generally speaking, you know, that will be a broad, you know, negotiation, right? And, you know, those landlords who seek to attract, I would say, clients of a certain type with certain expectations, uh, particularly around uh, software infrastructure and smart buildings, will cater to that market and others will not. And then so then the question is how you deal with the mismatch. And, you know, realistically, you know, I, I think we may go, we're going to go to a world which is probably somewhat bifurcated, which you're going to have, um, you know, a, an entire class of uh, real estate that's built out with the expectation that it may truly be multi-tenant within the same four walls. And then other spaces will be what we used to say in the old data center days, you know, uh, power, paint, and pipe, which are bare minimum, where effectively the tenant at any given time um, can effectively roll their own solutions for environmental controls. But I would expect that that's going to, you know, exist across a spectrum of, you know, the various real estate asset, you know, classes that are out there for tenants to choose from. Um, and that's going to, you know, take place over time. There's no question, and you would know this, the technology is getting better, the, for, the form factor is getting smaller, the interop interoperability is getting better. So, your ability to effectively ring fence four walls in the next few years is probably going to get a lot better, even if you're not getting much in the way of upfront investment by the landlord or owner. Yeah, just to that point, like Arnold, and I think uh, Lori just answered, that's her, the person's name, just asked something similar. Could you envision that there would be, say, like, you know, there's ULI, green building standards and whatever. Could you envision some kind of standard prototype protocol that would go out into the you know, the planning, the architecture, design, the construction um, communities where this would be the prototype of how you get people back to work in some capacity? Well, I think that there's going to have to be some policies instituted short term uh, across the board by municipalities in order to get people comfortable. I mean, if if you're saying that, you know, if, if let's say, you know, Los Angeles or, um, or San Francisco or New York is saying, OK, you could start going back to work in a phased approach you know, come, you know, July, let's say, there's going to have to, you know, but yet we want to have social distancing, there's going to have to be some, um, you know, mandates in terms of, you know, what's required of a building in order to be able to do that. Um, I think long term, which is an interesting, and I saw a couple of comments flashed up here, which I think are very true. I think long term, um, there is going to be um, um, building code changes in most major locations that are going to come as a result of what we've been dealing with with the pandemic um, right. as in past you know uh, health crises you know going back from the you know early you know 20th century you know where there were health and policy uh, decisions that were made um, you know legislatively and, and and building code wise as a result of the Spanish flu pandemic for instance and you know New York has seen a number of changes you know um, in terms of policies that happen. I do think that it's going to, you know, we're going to get building codes that are going to incorporate as necessities, as we do with ADA, uh, you know, some of the, you know, some of the technology pieces of what we're talking about, you know, in terms of, you know, um, 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 doors that open, you know, automatically by themselves and that type of thing. Um, I think the interesting one um, that has a lot of um, um, sort of security issues are what kind of legislation is there going to be, you know, in terms of, um, you know, temperature controls, you know, where you go into a building and it automatically, you know, monitors your temperature. Um, and, uh, you know, does it, you know, do we get something that also monitors whether you have the antibodies, you know, for that? I mean, I think there's a whole host of things that, you know, be, you know that, that sort of border, you know, on the Orwellian 
um, that you could see coming up in order to be able to maintain uh, people's uh, psychological uh, fear factors. Yeah, so, you know, um, a couple of thoughts on that. One is uh, if you get a chance to go to openpath.com and check out our blog, we just put a, a blog post up about um, the Bluetooth-based contact tracing that Apple and Google are working on. Yep. And uh, I think there's some interesting thoughts that our chief security officer has on, on explaining how that works, how it'll be an opt-in program where people can, you know, basically say, hey, you know, I've had it and I'm cured or I'm immune or whatever, so that we can kind of use that as a way to now think about um, you know, feeding that data to a number of different systems, perhaps in the building and the like. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, paying uh, for all of this, uh, to your point, becomes something that, you know, people are having to sort of figure out how to do really quickly. I think one of the things I liked about your advice is that there's, um, there's things that you can do right away, right? And then there's longer term things. So, uh, I was on a call yesterday with one of our big uh, portfolio owners, and, and there is a, a certification standard now for this kind of social distancing compliance that came out of Asia, kind of like this Wired Score and Lead and these different ones here in the U.S. Um, they've actually kind of come up with one there that is now trying to sort of come over here. So I think the industries will respond and the associations associated with this will, will sort of come together and find a way to do it. And it's just a matter of how you as a building owner uh, think about it, right? Uh, so as I've talked to even more and more folks who are in the transaction space, they're thinking about what is a building worth today? And so uh, a building that doesn't have social distancing technology and is not uh, upgraded with those compliance standards, um, if that building was to transact and be sold, uh, that might not be worth as much uh, as a building that does have all those uh, upgrades and investments. So there's a market opportunity for people to go in uh, and, and revitalize a building with these kind of new standards. And so they can buy it cheaper and sell it for more. Uh, and there's also an opportunity for existing landlords to invest in, and upgrade the value of their building. I, I think though, you know, we did want to talk a little bit today more about the occupier experience and, and the tenant experience. And so, um, you know, I see a number of questions on here about uh, Kinga here uh, sort of said, there's a gift somewhere in the presentation of an automatic door outfitted with open path reader allowing for access without needing to touch the door handle. Can you talk a bit about that and how you can implement that in your office? I mean, that's one of the easy pieces of low hanging fruit where you can uh, install an automatic door opener. Any of our system integration partners that we use or that are out there can put one in. It's just a hydraulic arm that pushes the door open. Think of the ADA compliant doors where you hit the handicap button and the door opens. Now, rather than having to actually hit that button, you can just basically use you know, the app on your phone, uh, which is you know, great because you can basically just press a button on your phone and the door unlocks. You can do that for elevators too. So that's one of the things that we've been working on is integrating with both relay-based elevators, those are the elevators where you push the button as uh, compared to uh, destination dispatch elevators, where you basically go to that panel and you say, hey, I wanna go to the 13th floor and then it takes you to you know, cab A or cab B, whatever it is. And so those are the uh, technologies that you know, are being integrated with this so that you can have a mobile experience and not really have to touch anything. Uh, so um, as we kind of look at the rest of the questions here, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, there's a question here about has Gensler explored any modular construction that can be easily converted from hyper private to open space? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, that that's been discussed, particularly with, you know, we have a whole group of folks that are involved with, you know, designing products and that type of thing. Um, and I think that, you know, long term, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, I, I think one of the things that, again, if you go into the, what that phase two is and what some of the implications are, um, I, I, I think short term, you know, as, as James was, you know, talking about, there's a, a lot of the approaches and strategies are going to involve low hanging fruit. What can organizations do immediately without major retrofits to, to their space? I think long term, I mean, one of the changes that I see, you know, in addition to some of the legislative things that we talked about in terms of, um, you know, building code changes in terms of what buildings are going to require, is that there's really going to be a need and a desire on the part of tenants and clients to have spaces that are much more flexible and permeable. I mean, I think the days of, you know, creating, you know, these office, you know, designs, you know, that are very fixed in place, you know, and take major uh, overhauls to redo both in terms of cost and time are going to fall by the wayside. I think the ability, you know, for clients to be able to be in spaces that, that, that they can change and adapt to, you know, based upon the next disruption, 
you know, whether that disruption is, uh, you know, is health you know, related or climate related. Um, and I think, you know, this just points to the fact that, you know, we've, we've really missed the mark. And I mean, I, we've been talking to clients all along for, you know, five, 10 years about the need for flexibility. Um, you know, built-in flexibility tends to get more costly initially, you know, because it costs more to be able to create systems, you know, that are modular and changeable for the initial installation, but long-term, you know, they pay for themselves. And I think what we're going to see, you know, is the willingness of clients to spend more money up front to create more permeable office designs than they have in the past. Because again, I think the big lesson that we're all going to learn from this is that as unfortunate as this you know, situation has been and is for all of us, um, this unfortunately is not going to be the last one that we're going to contend with. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, you know, one thing that's come up a lot is antimicrobial uh, elements, uh, whether it's sprays or materials. And um, a lot of design folks I've spoken to have mentioned that uh, when you go to a hospital or a lab, you tend to see linoleum floors, you tend to see very sort of hard, more sort of antiseptic surfaces, which obviously don't carry and transmit disease compared to carpets and drapes and the like. Uh, I wonder if the aesthetic of the design uh, approach that we've taken to space also needing to change, or is this just a moment in time and, um, you know, it'll last for 24 months and then we'll get all cleaned up. And, and so uh, what do you, what do you think there, Arnold? Well, that's the, you know, I mean, to me, that's one of the unknown unknowns, you know, I mean, the first unknown is, you know, what is the psychological you know, ramifications of the trauma that we're all dealing with in terms of the fear of going back to work. The question is, you know, a year from now, if we have a vaccine, you know, and, you know, people feel a little bit safer coming in without having to worry about the social distancing, do people have short-term memories and go back to some of the things that, well, you know, it'd be nice to, you know, to pay for, you know, materials and, you know, and, and fabrics and things like that, you know, that A, may cost more, uh, but will keep us safer or may not look as wonderful um, um, as something else. And do we then sort of, you know, swing back to, you know, to some old, you know, bad um, um, uh, habits. I think that's an unknown. I mean, I, th I think that there's the ability, I mean, I think, you know, we've been talking to clients obviously about, you know, sustainability programs and, 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 and wellness programs and the importance of wellness programs. And those are things that many clients see, you know, have seen in the past as somewhat of a nice to have, but we can't afford it. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of a, um, of a need to people to spend money to be able to do it. I mean, I think, again, one of the other long-term things are that we're seeing is that, you know, now we, you know, well, pre-pandemic days, you know, you know, working with clients, you know, there's sort of been a unifying element in terms of what clients were looking for in their workplace across industries, you know, because the, the, the great common unifier of people hiring people is that everybody needs that 30-year-old technical savvy individual. And so, you know, if you're an insurance organization, you still know that you need to hire that same individual that would just as soon be working for Microsoft or for Google, and therefore your workplace, you know, needs to take on some of the attributes in terms of amenity rich environments. I think one, you know, in, in order to attract, your, you know, the, the best and brightest in your industry, I think one of the things organizations are gonna have to prove to prospective tenants once people do get back to work um, and people do, you know, have to start hiring people again, is that they're going to wanna be able to prove to prospective employees to get their best and brightest, you know, that they've created, you know, a safe and healthy work environment for them. You know, how, I think one of the questions that employees are gonna have, you know, going into a job interview is, you know, what do you have in place that's going to keep me safe? Um, as opposed to, you know, can I get a free cup of coffee? Yeah. Not to get too far afield, but I think it is important to, is to recognize what we don't know. So one of the challenges, there are things that we're all obviously thinking about, which is how do you make sure your environment is clean, is safe, that you minimize kind of repeated diverse contact with your hands, on you know a door handle or or anything else, but we're still so early. We don't actually know what the environments that are most problematic from a transition vector perspective are. Right? They seem to be a function of, you know, density, duration, demographics, and a couple of other factors. But you know, 
how much has public transportation in New York been, you know, a, a key transmission vector, right? If you look at what's happening in nursing homes and hospitals and the rate of infection there, it seems to dwarf even what Las Vegas casinos have seen with 4,000 rooms that are fully occupied. And so, and in, in that all may change, but the point is we don't know. And so it's hard to design also for a world where you can make it safer than it was before, but you still actually don't understand where your greatest and least areas of risk are. And I think something that will fundamentally change where we invest the money and how we invest it is a deeper understanding about where we're actually most vulnerable and where you get the, rate, the greatest return on safety and wellness from an investment perspective. And I still, I still would submit we don't know nearly enough to make prudent investment in these areas, although I think directionally the things we're talking about are correct. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I would, Sean, I would just, from your perspective, I'd love to just understand, and I know you've talked about this in the beginning, is what, what are some of the, um, the, the sort of the milestones uh, that you're looking for in order to determine when you're going to bring back your employees to work and what, and what capacity? Like, what's going to help, what's going to make those decisions for you a little bit easier? Yeah, you know, I think it's multifactorial. I think certainly, you know, we're going to rely on, you know, uh, on the guidance that we're getting, um, you know, from, you know, local and state public health officials and leaders, um, you know, looking at hospitalization rates, looking at testing rates, having a better picture to understand what the risks are. I think it also matters, um, you know, the nature of the, um, your population, how vulnerable are they, you know, on the basis of their age and the way the, the work that they do together. And you need to be very, very careful around privacy with that. But I think at a high level, you can make, we're going to be able to make increasingly informed decisions. Fortunately for us, we're, you know, able to mostly work from home effectively and definitely. So I think we get to take advantage of a better information picture, you know, and I would say what we're expecting is the information flow we'll receive will allow us to make more informed decisions and mitigate risk um, relative to other companies, which absolutely depend on whether they're businesses that are deemed essential in this circumstance or are evaluating the risk reward scenario based on being in a very, very acute position from a standpoint of continuing to operate, right? And so if you're a information driven internet company like ours, we're actually very fortunate to be able to take stock of information over a longer period of time. And so, you know, one of the challenges I would say in general is in order to make an informed decision, we need much better data than we have. I mean, California last I looked had tested 0.3% of the population. So what's the infection rate in the state of California? No one knows. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult to say, okay, in a world where we actually don't know anything more about the infection rate that we did a month ago, let's go back to work tomorrow. And so I do think in order to make a more informed decision where you can actually say the risk profile is lower than it was at this point in time, we absolutely need more data than we have today, which is why the thrust of our focus has been when we go back, regardless of what it is, what are the things we need to do to get back to work effectively? It's helpful. It's great insights. Yeah. Well, we're coming on to uh, sort of the end of the hour and there's uh, still a lot of questions coming in. Um, and so uh, we've teed up a lot of uh, further uh, topics to debate uh, maybe next week. And so we'll see what we can do to put part some three, man, part three, keep going. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, I'm very appreciative of uh, Sean Arnold and Michael for uh, coming on board and, and helping here. I think uh, these uh, sort of webinars have been super helpful and a lot of people are getting their questions answered. I want to make sure that everybody can get a hold of us if they need to. So um, a couple things. One, our email addresses are here on the screen. Uh, everyone on the call has agreed to take emails. So, you know, send us a note or questions that you might have. Uh, you know, think about. Obviously, you know, Gensler is a leading architectural design firm and is there to sort of help and support you, whether you're an occupier or uh, a building owner. 
Um, uh, CRE Tech is one of the leading thought uh, leadership and and sort of you know community organizations in the in the commercial real estate space. And so Michael is a resource that is helpful, literally connecting people in, in all walks of, of of the commercial real estate space. And Leaf Group is just a tremendously strong e-commerce business that uh, is led by a great guy and uh, has a great group of people working there. And we're rooting for you guys to uh, you know um, come out of this even stronger. So appreciate everybody taking the time today. Uh, and um, you will get an email uh, with a link to the webinars. You can find the recorded webinars at openpath.com forward slash webinars. They'll all be there so that you can go back and see them anytime you want. And um, I appreciate everybody's help today. Hey, I just got to thank you again, James, uh, really for your leadership, for uh, hosting and organizing these webinars. They're the most, some of the most uh, engaged and uh, most viewed that we've ever seen and done and been a part of. So it's uh, you and Open Path are just doing a great job helping everybody sort of just sort of see through this fire of war that we're all in with a greater clarity. So thank you and great, great content, uh, Arnold and Sean. Really terrific. Very helpful for me. And hopefully the audience seems like it has been. Good job. Thanks, guys. Thanks so Thanks much. Next week. Thanks a lot. Really, Next really week. appreciate it. Great to be here. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James. My pleasure. Thank you. Great event. Excellent. All right. Let me see how to stop recording here and do all this. And uh, we will end meeting.